Hey guys, welcome back to History with Mrs. Lee. Today is one of our final installments of U.S. Presidents. We're going to take a break for a while until we get to um, Abraham Lincoln, number 16. So today we are looking at President number 7, Andrew Jackson. Okay, We're going to go ahead and start with his election of 1828. Now, I want you to recall that in 1824, Andrew Jackson ran for president against John Quincy Adams. And since nobody won the majority, nobody was over 50%, it went to Congress to decide who was going to be president. And in the corrupt bargain, John Quincy Adams made a deal with Henry Clay to make him his secretary of state if he threw his vote towards John Quincy Adams. So Andrew Jackson felt like in the election of 1824, he had the presidency stolen away from him. Well, he comes back in 1828 and faces off again against John Quincy Adams. But he had something on his side, and that was that in 1828, there was no longer a land requirement to vote. So suffrage was expanded so that all white men could vote. And that meant that the common man, like the regular guys, a lot of Southerners and Westerners, um, maybe farmers, they were finally going to get a voice in government because they felt that Andrew Jackson, who did not come from an aristocratic background, he came from just a regular background, even kind of poor, they felt like, okay, we're going to vote for this common man who's just like us and we will get to have a voice in government. And that is true to an extent because Andrew Jackson practiced something that we called the spoil system. And it's basically where you reward your political supporters with government jobs, even if they're not qualified for the position. Sometimes this is referred to as nepotism. Maybe you pick a friend or a family member for a job, even if they don't have the qualifications. Okay. Now, Andrew Jackson is notorious for not following along with Supreme Court laws and using his veto power excessively. So one of the first things that we talked about yesterday was the war on the bank. Andrew Jackson greatly disliked the National Bank. He felt like it only gave loans out to the wealthy and that it did not give enough loans out to the common man. So when the bank's charter, like its permission slip, was up for renewal, Andrew Jackson decides to not renew the charter. He takes all the federal money out of the National Bank and puts it into state banks, ultimately killing the National Bank. This technically would be considered a violation of the Supreme Court case McCullough versus Maryland because in that case in 1819, the Supreme Court deemed the National Bank to be necessary and proper. So this is the first time that he's really going against the Supreme Court. We also talked about the nullification crisis, and we talked a lot about vocabulary here. In the nullification crisis, the state of South Carolina was fed up with paying tariffs. Remember, a tariff is a tax on imported goods. South Carolina and other southern states did most of their trading with European countries because they traded things like their cotton and tobacco. But the tariff was enacted by President number six, John Quincy Adams, and called the Tariff of Abominations because it was going to force people in the South to try to stop buying goods from foreign countries and start buying domestic goods and help support northern factories. Well, South Carolina is upset, so they nullified the tariffs. They said, we are going to cancel these tariffs. We think they are unconstitutional. And you know what, Congress, if you don't get rid of these tariffs, we're going to secede. We are going to leave the Union and not be a part of the American country anymore. Jackson is very angry about this. He threatens to send in the troops, and he even threatened to hang his vice president, John C. Calhoun, who was a South Carolinian and who had kind of egged them along and told them, sure, you can nullify it. Well, before a civil war could break out, we have the great compromiser, Henry Clay. And so he comes to the rescue and he makes a compromise tariff. He says, South Carolina and other southern states are still going to pay this tariff on imports, but we're just going to reduce the amount of the tariff each year. Okay. Now, today we talked about 1830 and this law was passed, the Indian Removal Act. This is where the federal government said they were going to give money to Native Americans or compensation 
to get Native Americans to move west. Basically, the federal government was interested in land in Florida and Georgia and a little bit of Tennessee. Okay, so these men in the federal government were interested. They thought maybe there's some gold on the land or some other valuable resources. The Indian Removal Act was going to force Native Americans to move to what is called the Indian Territory, and that is modern state Oklahoma and a little bit of Kansas. All right, well, the Cherokee, here they are, the Cherokee feel like, you know what, we lived on this land, it was given to us in the 1700s in a treaty from the federal government, we don't feel like we should have to move. And so they take their case all the way up to the Supreme Court, and that court case is called Worcester versus Georgia. And interestingly, John Marshall, Supreme Court Chief Justice, he is still on the court, and you would think that he would have sided with the government because we know his history, but he actually chose to side with the Cherokee. And he said the Cherokee did not have to move. They did not have to listen to this Indian Removal Act. They could stay put. Okay? Well, Andrew Jackson is back to defy the Supreme Court, and he goes ahead and he tells federal agents that they can go ahead and enact the Indian Removal Act and re remove the Indians from Georgia and Florida and Tennessee. Now, they were striking a little bit of a deal, so Native Americans were given about $5 million for the land. However, when you think about how much land they were giving up and giving up land that they legally had the right to, it just doesn't seem like fair compensation. These Native Americans were forced by the federal government to move west to that Indian territory. So Jackson completely ignores Worcester versus Georgia, and these Native Americans are packed up and moved 1,100 miles to Oklahoma and to Kansas. On this journey of 15,000 Native Americans, approximately 4,000 passed away due to disease and starvation. Okay. Now, Andrew Jackson is known a lot in political cartoons, but specifically the one where he's dressed up as a king. And a lot of people compared Andrew Jackson to a king or to a tyrant, somebody who abused his powers. And some reasons for that would be because he is one of the first presidents who abuses his veto power. Every time laws were made by Congress and they'd come to his desk, he liked to, you know, give it a second thought. Well, nope, think we're going to veto it. He also was known for ignoring Supreme Court rulings and trying to make the president's uh, branch, the executive branch, way too strong. <laughs>